So today we're going to spend a little time digging deep into compost, which is a fun, fun adventure for everybody. Uh, I'm Brian Caldwell. I work uh, with the Reduced Tillage Organic Vegetable Project at Cornell. And I've been an organic farmer for, uh, since the uh, late 70s. I uh, had a small-scale vegetable operation and have been doing research at Cornell uh, since 2005. And I, I thought that I had a pretty good handle on you know, the basics of compost. I thought it was pretty straightforward uh, to be used as a fertility amendment on soil. That's mostly what we're going to be talking about today is in the field for vegetable production. Well, <laughs> let me share with you just a couple of, uh, a couple of our research experiences and then we'll, we'll hear these uh, excellent uh, farmers and a compost producer talk about it. Uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to talk about my, uh, some of these research results that, that uh, puzzled me. Uh, Carl Hammers here with the Vermont Compost Company, who, who has many, many years of experience uh, producing compost, uh, both for soil mixes, potting soil mixes, which is, I think, almost the main thrust now, but also for field production as well. And we're going to ask him to focus mostly on the field aspect of it and not so much on the, on the uh, potting soil, but there's overlapping issues, uh, particularly about compost quality there. Uh, Justin Rich from Vermont, Burnt Rock Farm. Uh, uh, I don't know Justin too well, but highly recommended by Vern Grubinger, and that's, that's a high recommendation, so, all right. And Seth Jacobs, who I know a little better. Uh, Jeff, Seth is one of the, from um, Slack Hollow Farm in the Hudson Valley. Uh, outstanding organic grower uh, who was just at the previous workshop on uh, vegetable uh, uh, diseases and pests. And I uh, had some good things to say there and showed his beautiful farm. Okay, so uh, we're going to spend about uh, 15 minutes uh, with each of us. And then we're going to turn it over to this group. And it's a huge group, which is great. I think there's going to be a lot of insights from you in the audience as well. And I, I really uh, hope you'll share them with everybody. All right, so getting into this, uh, some of the research that we are doing. Um, We've been working on reduced tillage and organic uh, vegetable systems and uh, looking at some deep zone tillage. Okay, and I, that's a, like a whole other topic, but we thought we'd do a little fertility experiment. And uh, in deep zone tillage, we're, we're tilling a strip. It's like a type of strip tillage, and, the, and maybe, uh, maybe half of the, the, um, uh, the field is tilled in strips, but the other half in between is left alone. So the question is, okay, does it make sense to put your fertility just where the strip is, where it's going to be tilled and where the, where the crop is going to be? Or does it, maybe you could just broadcast over the whole area and it wouldn't make any difference? And, you know, what would be the best kind of fertility to use? So it seemed really straightforward and we designed this experiment. So we were using blood meal as a very available nitrogen source. Nitrogen was the main nutrient that we were looking at in this experiment. The uh, fields that we use are, are really pretty high in P and K. So we're not, we're not expecting to have any issues with those, but nitrogen was going to be the one that we really wanted to focus on. So we had blood meal as our, our uh, quickly available nitrogen source. We were using the Cornell compost uh, as, our, as our sort of typical compost um, product, and then a control with no fertility additions. And we were looking at banding in the row versus broadcast. We repeated the same thing in, in the second year, and we used a couple more sources of, of uh, compost. Uh, Crayer's composted chicken manure product, which is sort of a, you know, it's like in between uh, chicken manure and a, and a typical compost. It's a pretty hot type of compost, a lot of available uh, nutrients from that. And then Fessenden's dairy compost, which is a pretty high quality dairy compost. Well, anyways, in year one, where we use compost, uh, we actually uh, got uh, to just cut to the chase, either the same or else poorer results than we did where we applied no compost and no, no fertilizer whatsoever. Okay, that was not what I thought was going to happen. And uh, the, the early growth was a little slower where we put compost, especially right in the row. And then uh, the final yield was about the same. It was numerically lower but statistically not different. Okay, and uh, on the other hand, blood meal did increase the yield in this experiment. So I thought, oh, that's, that seems sort of odd. 
Um, we repeated the, the same experiment in the, in the second year and got no differences at all between any of the treatments, including some that had up to like 160 pounds uh, per acre of nitrogen from, from compost and blood meal combined, um, and some that had no additional nitrogen at all. Well, anyways, that wasn't what I expected. This is what the experiment looked like. We grew winter squash was the crop, and you can sort of see, I don't know if this is a pointer or not, I'm afraid to, to even look, but you can look at that and you can sort of see um, that some, some parts of the field maybe are a little, this is early in the season, a little slower growing than others, and uh, there were some differences that we picked up, but this was probably from the first year. The second year we found, we found no differences whatsoever. Uh, that was transplanted, transplanted, um, was it honey bear? Honey bear, uh, acorn, uh, summer, bush summer squash is what the, the, that uh, is. So uh, we also uh, repeated the same experiment on Long Island and in Maine. And in, in Long Island, they had basically had almost identical results to what we had in the Ithaca area. Uh, and they use a leaf-based compost there. In Maine, they got a, a compost response uh, in the first year and they got no response from the blood meal. And what was going on there was that the compost had phosphorus in it, and their, their site was really low on phosphorus. They didn't add uh, enough phosphorus to, you know, to supply the needs of the crop. So, th so there was a compost response. It was from the phosphorus in the compost. And I want to just, just a very quick aside, say that um, compost is an excellent source of phosphorus. And that can be good and bad, I mean, but it can be really good if you, if you, if you want to use, um, if you want to get uh, phosphorus from compost, this is me going off out in left field here, but essentially you can use a much lower reduced yield, because, or much lower amount of total phosphorus than, than the recommendations from your land grant, because that phosphorus will not get bound up instantly when it's applied to the soil the way triple superphosphate will and it will be available for the whole season. And plants don't actually use very much uh, phosphorus. We'll get back to that later, but I always, I'm always kind of harping on phosphorus. All right, well, so what was going on here? One thing that I thought after, after this is that we could recommend to our organic farmers, you don't have to use any fertility for your crops. <laughs> but then I thought, eh, I don't think that's really true. And it's not really true. So uh, what was really going on here was that there was some kind of a quality issue with, the, with this compost. And we didn't get a response from it, even though, I'll, I'll show you some um, information about the, the tests. Uh, it tested pretty, pretty well, tested good. And so, so that was what was going on in, in, uh, in year one. You know, we, we don't know exactly what that was, and we'll talk about that some more. In year two, where we got no response from anything, including even the blood meal, what we had there was, was actually pretty informative. Um, the, the background levels of fertility were so high that no matter, in this case, we actually really didn't need any, any fertilizer to get the maximum yields from that field. And I'll talk a little bit about what that was all about. Now, in, in the Long Island experiment, their compost had a, a, a sort of a moderate to slightly high, slightly elevated CN ratio of about 24. And everybody knows the CN ratio is the uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio. And the lower that is, especially below 20 and maybe 15, then that nitrogen in the, in the compost is going to be available, or even in a plow down green manure, which can also do the same analysis of how much carbon and how much nitrogen, that um, nitrogen is going to be available to, available to the crop. If it's up in the 40-60 uh, uh, CN ratio range, then there's going to be uh, immobilization, uh, a temporary basis, but, but enough to hurt your crop severely, uh, from, from the fact that the microbes are going to go after the car, they're going to use the carbon as an energy source, they're going to take all the nitrogen uh, that's available in the soil, and the, and the plant won't be able to get it. So the, the CN ratio is a really, really critical thing. Well, we th this, is, this is a little bit marginal, 24. It should be below 20, I think, is, is, is uh, ideal. And actually, we may be finding it should even be lower than that. <coughs> so we got unexpected results. The, the, the uh, testing of the Cornell uh, compost, 
The CN ratio was 15, which should have been fine, should have been excellent. Uh, we did some uh, more involved testing of this because we were really trying to figure out, well, what's going on? And uh, it, it had a good maturity index. Uh, the Woods End Lab in Maine will do a, um, a maturity test with their Solvita methods. That was good. Low conductivity, sometimes salt, can be an issue with, with uh, compost. Uh, and if the, high, if the conductivity is high, it means that you have um, high salt, and that can interfere with the moisture uptake of your crop. But that wasn't going on. And uh, again, that, that uh, N to P ratio is just my whole phosphorus thing, but, but that's a kind of an aside. It, it had a pretty good, uh, pretty good ratio of, of uh, nitrogen to phosphorus. You, you don't want the, in some uh, compost, there's actually as much phosphorus as there is nitrogen, so like a one to one ratio. And really, that's not a great uh, sort of sustainable uh, fertility product. But anyways, uh, for this purpose, uh, the, the, there was plenty more nitrogen than phosphorus. Okay, the way this compost is made, it's made with uh, turning according to the, you know, heating and turning according to the NOP specifications. Um, and it's made from uh, manure and bedding from the Cornell Vet Veterinary School, plus there's a, a couple of small uh, animal uh, uh, groups on campus that gets manure from. And we have done experiments in past years from this same, uh, with the same compost uh, source. And we had sort of had head scratching um, results from that as well, where we put higher levels on and we didn't get a boosted yield in, in some cases. And so this really kind of brought it all out in, into full focus. So again, with, with some more uh, uh, intensive testing at Woods, Woods End, th there was um, an indication of some herbicide carrier, which can, or carryover, excuse me, which can be a, an issue with compost. Uh, the feedstocks that go into the compost, if there's animals that are eating hay that has been treated with stinger and some of these uh, uh, persistent um, uh, herbicides, it will sometimes come right through the compost and, and it can do a lot of damage. But um, their testing showed that it, that it was they were really it was it was there, but it was really low levels. And in fact, they ha they do a bioassay where they grow plants in pots with your compost, and it didn't it didn't uh, impede the growth of those young seedlings at all. So that should not have been an issue. Now, what's what's interesting? I just uh, found out about this a little while ago. There's um, some new research um, from Italy talking about compost applications, and they were saying that that even Compost with a good CN ratio, which is, again, it was the kind of the situation that we're in, some of it can have a lot of available carbon, like soluble carbon in it. That, like, a lot more of that carbon can be in soluble form. And if so, basically you can, you can alter the, the microbial community uh, in, in, the, uh, in the field. It, it has a deleterious effect on, on uh, uh, some of the uh, mycorrhizal fungi. And, and it also, that, that, uh, that sort of quickly co soluble carbon can be, um, you know, can immobilize nitrogen to some degree. So that, that was sort of a clue for me that, okay, even though the, the, our standard testing seemed to indicate that this compost was good, maybe we had a, a batch of compost that's like what they were um, describing there. And um, this is the, some more from that article uh, by... Cosolino and, uh, and, and others. Uh, but basically, this, this idea that the higher the amount of labile, which means available and, and sort of uh, movable, uh, and hydrophilic, meaning water-loving or soluble uh, carbon in the compost, the greater uh, became the activity of ant antagonistic microflora. So, so there we go. And, and, uh, but the question is, is OK, how do we know when our compost has a lot of uh, soluble or, or you know, um, labile carbon? And that, I hope Carl might help us to answer. I don't know if he, I didn't, I, I, I'm, he's not totally uh, prepared to answer that question, but maybe he will, he might know. But I think, I think what, they were, what they were basically sort of saying in this article is that we, we need to do a lot more research and find out about how to characterize this. But I think it might be a, a good step uh, forward in, um, in analyzing and using, utilizing compost. Well, in the second year of this, this experiment, okay, why was there no, no response? And that field uh, was not a good choice to do an organic fertility experiment because 
the organic, so organic matter level was 7%. So that, a lot of nitrogen, a lot of oomph was being supplied just by the organic matter that was in that soil on the research farm. So how did, how did, the, how did, how did we get a, a field like that on the research farm? Well, that, that had been in, in experiments in the past, and previ the previous year was in winter wheat, fertilized with compost at a pretty heavy rate. Okay, that's no, no big deal. But before that, it had been in a two-year cycle with rye undersown with red clover, which grew for, grew for an entire year. And that, that really will, you know, juice up the, the nitrogen status of the soil. And, and over several years, uh, several cycles of doing that, I, I guess it can raise the organic matter level up to 7%, which is really high. Our, our kind of background level would be more like 4%, which would be good. And on a, on a, and a you know, heavily used... Uh, on this soil type, a heavily used field might be more like two and a half or three. So somehow this management on this organic research farm jacked the organic matter levels up to 7%. And um, we can learn from that. That was, that's an excellent soil building program. And, and with that level of, of soil building, uh, which could fit into some of our, you know, like, one year in vegetables, one year in cover crops, one year in vegetables, or maybe like two and two, two and two. Maybe we can approach some of those things where we really won't need uh, additional uh, nitrogen applications. So I'm going to leave it at that and uh, switch it over to Carl. And I hope, Carl, you can respond to some of the questions I've raised here. But I, I really, and I hope that some of you will digest this and, and again, share, share at the end. So. Uh, thank you, Brian. So um, what do we just learn? Um, one of the things that compost is a word. It's a noun, it, it, but it, it doesn't, it, what it really is is very situation specific. It, it, compost, yeah, it's a word. So, um, and, and we've talked about several different composts here. And, 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 and some of the emphasis of this trial is talking about what compost can provide to a crop that it's placed more or less simultaneously with. Um, I think generally this points out a couple things. One is that research is always subject to the situation. Um, and the other is that really out of seed compost in general and as a, a means of, of, of providing a basis of food into the soil community. So back to the idea that we're gonna feed soil and we're gonna let soil and plant and let plant through its foraging partnerships and its capacity to secrete sugar enzyme sir syrups that are very targeted at, at partners. Uh, and the compost needs to be available to it. And so what do we really want from our composts? Uh, we want them to be pretty stable. I mean, CN ratios, we, I, I actually think that there's that higher CN ratios than are typically, um, I think 24 is a very, can be a very good CN ratio because ultimately we'd like that compost to arrive in the soil with as much carbon as possible of whatever carbon there was in the beginning when the compost combustion started. I mean, as a mass balance thing, I think all of us should be trying to get our compost as appropriately processed for soil entry as possible. So in order to make compost, you have to start out with a, some questions. What do you got? And what do you want are the big questions because compost is not an abstraction. It's actual stuff. And it's, it's a, a highly um, condensed and rapid sequence of, of metabolic processes that are simultaneously tearing down and building up structures. Um, you were hoping I was going to actually answer <laughs> questions. No, this is good, Carl. <laughs> this is good. So, you know, some of you, I mean, how many of you are vegetable growers? Yeah. All right. So this, how many of you make your own compost? Nice. And how many of you buy compost? All right. So, and both are, you know, uh, reasonable things to do. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, on our farm, to the extent we put soil directly in ground for cropping, we like to, I like to get in early with fairly young compost and put it in into the catch crop or prior generally. Uh, we, we, we mature compost beyond what I think are 
absolutely optimum for field work in order to use them in very high concentrations as in half of media. Okay, does there, anyway, I go further with that? It's like, so in the field, you're getting a much higher dilution, the whole mass of the soil matrix compared to a container. And uh, we weren't gonna mostly talk about containers, but containers are actually a very interesting place to assess compost quality. That's why Woods End grows in a high concentration of compost to tease out things like pyrene herbicides. Um, so, you know, we're aware that, that, that frequently compost ends up being utilized in some cases, our compost that we sell to growers, as basically 50% of the working surface of a bed sometimes. And that in compost intensity is there because these areas of production are really working very, very hard. And this, I mean, we know that, that we can go to those levels of compost making and, uh, and have it increase yield. When people go into the 100% zone with an unamended compost, it usually doesn't work very well. Um, though we do a bunch of trials in 100% because again, we're trying to tease out some of the most difficult to understand components. So we generally do bioassays on our compost before we utilize them in a container. And uh, we don't typically in our own farm do bioassay. Well, we do bioassays back into raw because we want to know what suppression looks like. So we're, we're always growing plants in increasingly raw compost. And frankly, compost can be quite immature in terms of normal understandings and still support plant growth very well. Um, and so why is that and when is that? Well, you know, this is a thing about balance and it's a thing about diversity. So in general, you want your compost to have more components than less. And I, again, I'm generalizing, um, all right, bringing it back, I'm, I'm almost out of time probably. Um, I, I'd love to t throw it out for a question, or is that inappropriate right now? Well, let's wait until the All end. Right, wait until yeah. the end. So th th I'll leave you with that simple tweet. <coughs> Compost is a noun. It's just a word. It's like love or communism. It's very situation specific. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, Every, it all matters. All right. <laughs> Good morning. This is going to be a little different than Carl's. Okay, so I don't know nearly as much about compost as Carl, so I'm mostly going to talk about how we use, how our fertility system on our farm incorporates compost or doesn't incorporate compost. I'm going to start off with a disclaimer, that's not compost. Hey, Carl, can I have the clicker? I have two children in daycare, so I've come down with a case of the Januaries. <laughs> this is wood ash. All the pictures you're going to see of anything that looks like a spreader is actually wood ash, not compost. Because I don't have any good pictures, apparently. <laughs> but just in case anybody's ever used wood ash or never heard of it, it's awesome. We don't use lime on our farm, just wood ash. So it does all our lime and gives a lot of calcium, but a huge amount of potassium, which is kind of like the secret ingredient to a lot of high yielding vegetables, it turns out. A little bit of farm background. Up until the last couple of years, we had about a 17 acre tillable land base. We bought a 10 acre field this summer and then accidentally another 12 acre field this summer because that's how it worked out. It's more than I wanted to do. Um, but it takes a lot of pressure off of our system, certainly. So we were kind of you know, 15 acres on 17 acres of land base is getting a little tight. Um, so this next coming year, we'll have 15 acres in vegetables, 10 acres in cover crops, and then we're going to plow under 11 acres new that we still have two years left on an organic transition. Um, lots of sandy loams, very fine sandy loams, rocks in certain sections. And this is all important because in terms of fertility, we live in an extremely rainy part of the world. So this, if I get five and a quarter inches in a month, I'm really happy because we've gotten as much as 17 in a month. Every other year we get at least one month with 10 inches. Usually it's June, which is disappointing. So well-drained soils, and these soils are about two feet thick and these start hitting a lot of pretty big cobbles typically. 
So they drain really well, but they don't have a whole lot of reserve deep down, except for all that K from the year before that washed down three feet. And we are up in northwest Vermont, so zone 4B, so we regularly get negative 20 in the winter. That doesn't really affect much in terms of vegetables, except for the fact that we can get frosts all the way to June 1st, and we got a frost on August 31st this year. It didn't kill anything, but it happened. So it could have been worse. Uh, our, our farm is mostly winter storage crops. We started the farm, well, my wife works full-time off-farm, so we started the farm when I was still managing another farm, so we just started growing stuff, putting it in storage, and selling it over the winter when I had more time. So now, our, you know, that's sweet potatoes. So we have these nice curving fields all along the Huntington River, um, which is all what I'd call paleo floodplain, because these floodplains were all established when there were glaciers. So now if there's no glaciers, the Huntington River is kind of like what I grew up in Columbia County, New York, we would have called that a very small creek. Um, and so our fields in our home farm have never flooded, even though they're floodplain. This field also, floodplain that never floods. Also means it doesn't get replenished with anything, but I'll take that. Uh, a lot of storage, so we have a big storage barn that we do a lot of potatoes, sweet potatoes, winter squash, um, onions, and then a smattering of summer crops in the summertime. We're 95% wholesale, um, and we really, really, really try to maximize yield on everything. I mean, who doesn't really? But it's really important if you have a limited land base and you're trying to make a living off of storage crops, you need to you know, get conventional yield, let's put it that way. And we're stretched over six miles of river valley, so we do a lot of roading and tractors, so this is how a lot of stuff comes into the farm is on flatbeds. Um, storage crops, so half our sales are after mid-November. Our busiest sales month is November. Um, this is a barn we built two summers ago. It's been great. Um, it's the bill I mind paying the least every month because it's a truly awesome place to store vegetables and most importantly to have your crew work all winter. This barn is, well, most of this barn is 57 degrees and well lit all winter, which is a really nice place to wash potatoes. So wash station, and then we're all wholesale, so it goes out. These green totes go to local stores. Wax boxes go to distributors. Okay, again, another picture of wood ash, but this is what I had. So just from our farm's fertility perspective, we take over mostly, that's one of our home farm fields. These fields are typically in very poorly managed hay, which is typically a mining operation. Um, but taking over a mined over hay field is great for vegetables. The organic matter is pretty good, and there are no mineral nutrients left. So you can put on as much compost as you want for a couple of years and get a lot of cheap nitrogen that way. Um, so this is one field from 2009, so we've never done anything to it. And some of these numbers are hilarious. Look at that, 1.5 parts per million phosphorus. 34 parts per million potash, you can't grow anything in that. These fields barely needed mowing in the summer. pH of 5.7, which I was surprised it was that high. Um, fast forward, all right, fast forward five years, here's the six years, here's the same field. Now, UVM and University of Maine changed their format, so it's kind of complicated, but. Phosphorus went up to 16.7 and potassium 106. They're even higher now, because this picture's from 2015. That's all to say that a lot of the fertility we can get easily and cheaply jacks your soil really, really fast. Does your phosphorus have any nutrients? Some fields. So, like it a good question, is our phosphorus over 20 parts per million? Some fields yes, some fields no. When we bought the farm, my, my goal was to get everything to 40. Because I knew phosphorus loading was a bit of a problem. I said, oh great, we get up to 40, that way you know it's, you have a nice buffer. And then in the last couple of years, Vermont has come out with regulations saying if you have phosphorus over 20, you have to devise a plan to draw it down. Um, I mean, there's some vegetable farms with two, three, four hundred parts per million phosphorus. Dairy farmers with limited land bases are, you know, similar. But it's funny, there's some, you know, the dairy farm in our valley, 250 cow dairy, and their phosphorus levels are like eight or nine, so it's not necessarily that they have to get jacked up just for being a dairy. So this is a field we just bought that had been rented by the dairy farmer for decades. 
And I was surprised that all these numbers were as low as they are. They had it on a year-to-year -year lease, so I didn't, you know, they weren't going to put too much into it, but I'm surprised they had 2.8 ppm phosphorus on a field that could have been manured. But they typically only put urea on that because it was just, um, it was just hay. So these are the, um, specifically, this is, you know, the native fertility of our um, mildly shallow spotosols in zone 4b. Okay, so when I think about using compost, I'm thinking about supplying my plants with the NPK they need and all the micronutrients and hopefully trying to keep some sort of credit in the organic matter column. We do as much cover cropping as we can. We're pretty intensive with it, but it's always nice if you can get your fertility with some carbon in it as well as Carl was mentioning. So when we bring a new field on, that's when we mostly use what I call a compost or what is legally called compost, but... How many people in this room have used Jeru's poultry compost? <laughs> Whoa. So it's like a three million layer chicken farm on Lake Champlain, north of Plattsburgh. And they'll sell you a 1200, for 1200 bucks, we can get a tractor trailer with 25 tons of 232 composted poultry manure. It's legally compost in terms of its heat, but It'll burn your eyes off if you dig into the pile and put it in front of your face. So it's definitely not finished. It's very, very, very rich, and it comes out as a 232. Is that the new barn or is yours just a barn? No. <laughs> I heard Guru's burned this yeah, summer. Yeah, other barns. Well, they have a bunch of barns. Yeah. Well, I, I, oh. I called them, and they said we're not doing any deliveries. So. Okay, I will call Sue. Let's see. We haven't bought any in two or three years because we only pretty much now put it on new ground because it's kind of, you get this really dirt cheap, you know, $1. thirteen a pound for nitrogen and you're getting a huge amount of potassium and phosphorus and calcium. So it's, if your nutrient management plant can handle that level of phosphorus, it's amazing stuff. Um, I don't know what kind of a soil conditioner it is, but it's, it grows greens and potatoes. Um, so we mostly use now Crayer's 822, which is pretty common, I'd assume, in New York. It comes from Western New York, so it drives by all your farms to get to us. Um, but even that, it gets to about $5 a pound for nitrogen, which that's just what we figure is the cost of doing business now to get low phosphorus nitrogen. So that's a 4 to 1 nitrogen to phosphorus ratio, which is, I think, pretty reasonable for us to use. That's roughly replacement rate on potatoes, at least. So these ones with the asterisks are just ones that I took off of the Nova Vermont bulk order. It's really, really expensive to fertilize this way. Six to ten dollars a pound for nitrogen. So the crayers are significantly cheaper now. I mean, these prices kind of depend on how much you're buying and if you're buying direct or through a fertilizer dealer. <coughs> but we used to use 543, but the phosphorus is too high, so now we're down to 822, which is quite a bit more money, but it's not that much more per pound of nitrogen, especially since they have to put more feather meal in it to get that analysis. So, you so that's just what I already mentioned. And if you're taking on a field with 1.5 ppm phosphorus, you don't mind that at all. But this field here has probably received nine tons per acre of Jeru's over the years, maybe six, and it's already that's actually not that high. We have some fields that are oh, close to 40 because they've got an extra load. But like I said, it's not a long-term fertility solution. It's a get your fields up to spec quick. So now we buy lots of crayers. It comes in one-ton sling sacks, and we just use a forklift, lick that up, and put it in a big fertilizer spreader and do our fields that way. So as everyone knows, the best source of phosphorusless nitrogen is not compost or fertilizers. It's cover crops. So here you can see nice nodulation on peas. And we do as much of that as possible, but since we're still building up phosphorus reserves on a lot of our fields, we haven't done a lot of intensive legume management because we, we haven't had to prioritize that. We cover crop as much as we can anyway to prevent soil nudity and try to get some carbon into our very light textured soils. But this will become a bigger part of our farm's rotations as we get more land and can have longer rotations. So the one place on our farm that we do buy nice, quote, expensive compost is in our greenhouses. Um, 
our greenhouses don't get cover crops. Our greenhouses get cropped pretty heavily. So we want to put in something that will provide some fertility, feed the soil microbes, hopefully suppress some soil diseases because I assume most people in this room will grow tomatoes and greenhouses grow them in the same greenhouse every year. Um, so this is the fourth year on cherry tomatoes just in this one greenhouse and so far they've been doing great. One of these days I'm sure it'll catch up with us but adding some nice compost really helps there I think. Oh, that's the last slide I guess. So I'll pass it on to Seth. And All right, well, it's amazing to see this many people here uh, <coughs> doing compost. Uh, and I hope you're doing a better job with it than, uh, than me. Uh, uh, my, our, I'm a mixed vegetable farm. I have gravelly silt loam, a little heavier. Uh, and uh, we, you know, we, we uh, bought our farm about 35 years ago. And uh, when we bought our farm in Washington County, which is the next county across the river from here, uh, there were 420 dairy farms in the county. Uh, and a lot of those were small dairies under uh, 50 cows, 50 to 75 cows, even smaller. Uh, everybody in this room, I'm sure, knows the, uh, where, where dairy's gone since then. Uh, the, uh, you know, unless you can change the cost structure uh, by being organic or doing a value-added product, there aren't very many fa small farms left. So we, we, uh, there was a dairy farm directly across the road from us, and they had a, uh, they were overfilling their barn, uh, a 50-cow barn with 75 cows, and they had a small land base. So there was a lot of times a year where they had no place to sp spread manure. So I went. Uh, uh, with th without a lot of information, I'm, I was a city kid. I didn't know much about farming. I wish I'd studied uh, studied it more before I started. But went into the compost business because I saw all this what looked like wealth to me, uh, just getting dumped and piled. And so I uh, geared up and I made a lot of compost. I even sold compost and we used a lot. And we th I thought, you know, I was the little baby brother of hippies, I thought, well, it's, you know, it's a natural product, it's got to be good, there can't be anything wrong with it, and used a lot of compost. Uh, and uh, used a l and when we started gr uh, growing higher value stuff in our and building high tunnels in the winter, uh, started selling in the winter, we kept building high tunnels uh, to grow greens in the winter, tomatoes in the summer, that sort of thing. Uh, really uh, was depending on compost for all my nitrogen for years and years in these greenhouses. And uh, uh, we put, the, we did a lot of damage that way. Don't do that. Uh, even our fields are, are out of whack because of too much, uh, too much calcium, too much, too much phosphorus, uh, too much magnesium. Uh, so you can really overdo it with compost. And what ended up happening in our tunnels is, you know, the, uh, f the phosphorus uh, uh, and calcium were so high, they, you know, calcium was preventing the uptake of potassium. And so what we started doing, uh, working with ex extension on, uh, on a, a three-year tomato study for fertility. And uh, what we ended up having to do was uh, we were finding that uh, potassium was being, uptake was being inhibited by huge levels of calcium. So we are now... Uh, doing, a, you know, a, uh, the only fertilizer we put down in our tunnels is nitrogen, so it's, you could put down a 10 zero, 0 or something like that. And uh, we are, have to, we, we are uh, fertigating with, and we're adding potassium, even though there's plenty of potassium in the soil, but it's not available. So we have to add water-soluble potassium. And we're stuck here, uh, and will be unless we move these greenhouses. Uh, and so uh, I offer you a cautionary tale about overdoing it with compost. Uh, it's, uh, it's really nice to see what's going on in Vermont where the state is stepping in and saying, look, if you guys aren't going to be good farmers, you know, there's all these shared resources that you're affecting and we're going to mandate it. And uh, uh, so I really appreciate what's going on across the border and I hope it's coming to New York. But uh, we're, we've... Uh, since then, of course, that dairy has closed, and uh, I don't use any compost. In fact, I'm even thinking of selling my manure spreader because I don't really have a use for it. We're using uh, 
we're using the 822 crayers and the 543 crayers uh, in the fields and really in, uh, you know, the state, if we're not going to do it, the state should put a stop to that and we should only be allowed to put down what's needed in the soil. And so I would just say be careful with compost. It's a great way to start and get your organic matter way up. Definitely start with a big load of compost and bring it up. But uh, don't continue with compost unless you really know, you really have tested and you know what's in the compost and what's needed in the soil. Because uh, if you're an uneducated farmer like me, you can really do a lot of damage, so. Great. All right. Good. Okay, well, I, I would love to hear um, some comments and questions from, from the audience. Yeah. And, and be loud, I'll try to repeat the question. Was the Italian research based on on-farm compost or off-farm compost? Was the Italian research based on on-farm compost or off-farm? Um, I don't know. Um, they, what, <clears throat> what they did in that study, to, to, to just uh, belabor it a little bit, um, they took some immature compost, and I don't know what the source was, but then they basically uh, like tr put it under certain conditions to essentially mature it for 30, 60, 90, and 120 days. But I, I'm actually saying this slightly wrong. They, they, they um, chose different batches of compost, and they, they chose them, they took them 30, 60, 90, and 120 days before they actually ran the pot, the pot trial. So they had, they had sort of different mature, they were looking at different maturities of compost, but what they actually found was that their 30 and, and 120 day maturity compost behaved positively and the same, and the, the 60 and 90, which was sort of from a different source, uh, or a different batch from the same, same producer, performed differently, and that's when they started doing all these intensive studies and to see why that was. And again, it all came down to, essentially, if you have too much available carbon compounds, then, then you can get into, into trouble with, with the microbial uh, community in the, in the field and also with nitrogen tie-up. But yeah, another question. Yeah, uh, way in the back. Is there, a, is there any way to really increase the organic matter content of your soil? Because I find like very lean soils, like the, the very fine sandy soils, low organic matter, but the nutrient levels are adequate, how can you continue boosting organic matter without potentially overloading some of those nutrients? Okay, so let's see if I have this right. You, you, you want to increase the organic matter of your soil. Mostly for water retention purposes. For, for soil improvement, soil quality, health improvement, soil quality improvement, but you don't want to necessarily bump up the nutrients. Right. Right. Let's have the, the panel talk about that one. Well, I, I am actually reminded of, uh, of uh, excuse me for a second. <laughs> Maybe it obeys me. I, I was reminded about a long running trial at, at Cornell with Remiel Wood. How many people are aware of what Remiel is, and the, that noun? Um, and, and, and Université Laval picked up that work in the 90s, but I think the Cornell trial started in the 80s, didn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, in the in the 50s. It's yep. All right. Well, so and really for that kind of continuous vegetable cropping on light soils, it's certainly the case that 10 pounds of of two inch minus hardwood, I mean 10 tons to the acre on an annual basis, will improve your organic matter content and your outcomes. Fully mature composts really need to be understood not as a they're not a long term carbon input to the soil. They are a catalyst for carbon drawdown of the, you know, uh, by plants. Um, so even Ramiel, you know, burying wood is better than burning wood. That's a kind of a motto on our farm where we use a lot of Ramiel because of the, of the specific pediological condition we're in where we really need uh, to, to spread out this occluded silt that we're farming. Um, so uh, yeah, so lend, you know, uh, and, and 10 ton to the acre seems to be the sizing where you don't, I mean the amount, where you don't actually tie up a lot of end, because raw wood chip can be an end tie up. So um, blending ray meals with compost, uh, you know, there's a frontier there that I think has a lot uh, to offer it. And 
really we're talking about trying to feed a vibrant soil community. So every time you can put your compost in sooner rather than later in the prior crop, in a catch crop, and utilize it to help uh, draw down atmospheric CO2 through the root exuded. We should all be <coughs> aspiring to grow glomalin. How many people know that word, glomalin? Yeah, and it's not just glomalin. We're now learning there are many, many other complex polysaccharides that produced by other biota, bacteria produce them. Many of them are more, are more or less stable. They're all the ephemeral um, root exudates now that, that happen through the growing season. And I think we're gonna understand over time how much increasingly how consequential they are. So, uh, yeah, I don't know Carl, if I- Carl, just a, uh, could you just say a, a couple words on exactly what glomalin is? I don't think- Yeah, so know. glomalin, it was a, it's a, a noun that derives from the taxa of uh, fungus, uh, glomalase, that mycorrhizal fungi are part of. A uh, woman named Sarah Wright, a researcher at U Beltsville, Maryland, uh, named it in 1996 and succeeded in developing a way to dye it green and photograph it. I encourage you to go look at her photographs. But basically, because mycorrhizae, mushroom roots, um, have the capacity to produce structures that are two decimal orders smaller than a plant can. So, you know, you get this root radical, which is a big thing coming out through the soil, and here are these, the, the symbiosis with these much finer um, my, little hairs, but they're, they're, they're not very rigid, and getting from par, par soil particle to soil particle is challenging for them. So they've developed this substance called glomalin, and they form what is called the glomalin sheath, which gives them rigidity, and it's a tube that they structure out of this glycoprotein. It's got carbon, it's got protein, it's got all kinds of things in it, and we now understand that there are many different glomalins produced by different species. Um, <coughs> and the, that tube is how the mycorrhizae sends water and phosphorus and the results of its foraging back to the plant. Mycorrhizae die relatively quickly. The plant root is rolling by, the mycorrhizae forage that neighborhood and senes die and the glomalin sloughs off and falls into the soil. So glomalin is literally the glue that holds it all together. It is why soil aggregates. So for 10,000 years, literally, people have written about soil aggregation and, and good tilth and all these things. And, and in the, uh, when science came along and humus was described, all wanted it to be humus kind of doing that, but that was vague and it didn't work. And anyway, as recently as 1996, that glue got named. And we now understand that frequently more than 30% of stable soil carbon is in these glomalin structures. Um, so it is, uh, you know, our goal should be to grow glomalin. And there are all these other, we're starting to learn about all these other polysaccharides that are relevant. Um, Justin, any thoughts on, on that, Justin? Um, so I took over fields that are fine sandy loams, hay for decades, and 2.7% organic matter. So there seems to be a natural limit to how high you can get under passive management. Um, now, the other thing is if that field had more fertility in it, it might have grown more roots, which would have had more fungal associations, and you would have had more glomel, and you might have had a lot more aggregate construction. Um, but I think the idea of taking a fine sandy loam and getting up to 5% organic matter without juicing the snot out of it with other stuff might be challenging. So don't beat yourself up. But if you're at one, one and a half, you can definitely improve. But if you start hitting three on some of these lighter soils, I mean, you're doing something right already. That's just loose guess. What kind of soil are you dealing with? Uh, uh, fine, fine sandy loam or gravel loam. I mean, my advice would be just the standard, lots of cover crops, use vetch in there for nitrogen, and uh, <coughs> as much, uh, as many cover crops as you can get between crops is the way to go. Oh, I'll just add one thing to that, that on our farm we have these terraces above the river. The one along the river is very coarse. The terrace above it is still a fine sandy loam, but it's much finer. Those were 5.7 to 6%. So it's just the texture limits air, and air is what facilitates organic matter degradation. 5.7 to start, and well, it was 5.7 to 6, and we're still 
you know, organic matter levels from year to year jump up, and it's a kind of a messy metric. So don't think just because you're up 0.2, it doesn't mean you're actually up 0.2. Oh, that, this is great. I just want to make a, a couple of comments. I um, feel like I'm learning, learning a lot and also having some of my thoughts kind of congealed and clarified. But what I'm hearing is that, that um, organic fertility management just to, is, a, is, a, is a sort of an ongoing process and not just targeted to the specific crop that's in the ground at that one time. <coughs> So one way to think about these weird results that we, that we had in our Cornell experiment was, well, we were really trying to just like target a fertilizer application in a sort of a very uh, substitution type of mindset to the crop that was going to be growing there. Whereas what our experiment told us was that if we had had a really outstanding uh, program of soil building with these, uh, you know, rye plus red clover, green manures, all that kind of stuff. We, we, that was the soil building that, that was, and that fertility that was needed for that crop. We had kind of already done it, and any additional things that we tar tried to target in the actual crop didn't make any difference. And, you know, I'm, I'm hearing that from you guys, and, and that, that in the beginning, <clears throat> when you have a new farm and a, and a field that's, that's pretty uh, depleted and poor, definitely go into, uh, go into it with, with, with heavy uh, applications of, of, a, of a cheap nutrient source, uh, which is compost. You could even, you can actually, uh, this is maybe heresy to some people, but you know, you can use raw manure, but use it on the cover crop, uh, not on the cash crop. So again, it's like one step behind, you know, or, or in advance of when the cash crop is going, you're prepping it that way. So this is kind of some of what I'm getting from it, and um, I, I appreciate that. Okay, some more, more uh, questions and comments. Jean-Paul. Well, well, I just want to add to the question of the, was two questions for organic matter and water retention. And what we have been finding um, in the past year when we did some experiment with um, rolling and crimping and minimum tillage is that, um, yes, the results, because ultimately what you don't want to do with tillage, because that's what we do. We all use compost because our organic matter goes down because we till. So what we want to do is do skillets. And what we're finding is, is that avoiding skillets, there was an interesting side effect of the rolling and crimping of a side-by-side -side crop is that with even amount of water and irrigation, the one that was rolling and crimped, the broccoli was planted in a hairy batch, did not wilt. And the one that was tilled, that was wilting. So there's something happening there when you start breaking up these aggregates is that, you know, they just don't have the water retention you need for. So whatever we can do to avoid tillage, and you're an expert here, Brian, you can talk about a reduced tillage project. That's really where the two really intersect. Yeah, could everybody hear that? Yeah, I, Jean Paul, that's a great, a great uh, point that a lot of the reason that we need to increase organic matter is because we till. So that's that's pretty profound and deep. One thing I wanted to point out too is that um, um, Carl was talking about ramiel chips and what that is uh, very specifically is uh, wood chips that are made from, from uh, branches that are um, two and a half inches or so in diameter or less and hardwood branches, not softwood. And, and that's um, the much higher nutrient com uh, content of that from all the little buds and twigs uh, as opposed to the, the, just the heartwood of the tree, which is just, has just nothing but you know, carbon compounds in it. But that's, uh, that can be a, um, a really good, um, as you point out, it's a, it could be a way to increase organic matter in the soil on a sort of a long-term basis without adding a lot of nutrients. It adds some, but not as much as compost and manure. Um, yeah. Just a quick question about something Carl said I didn't understand. You were referring to something about carbon drawdown for the plants, and uh, I just, I don't know what you're talking about. So question for Carl, what is, what is carbon drawdown? So this is back to the glomalin. The, the principal mechanism for putting atmospheric CO2 into soil is that liquid, those root exuded sugars that plants remunerate their foraging microbe partners with. And so any amending we do 
should be understood to be to try to set the stage for the big event. So Ramiel, <laughs> yes, you're, you're, you're sequestering carbon in the soil and it's a good practice for a lot of reasons. It really tends to feed the saprophytic structural, the, the dead eating fungus. As a, so mycorrhizae are, are host obligate. They can't life cycle without a plant sharing sugar with them. They can only be a spore or a fragment. But there are these other fungus that that white rots and so on that are beneficial and help and work in tandem to support the work of the mycorrhizae, if you will, um, that you get from a ramiel. But uh, everything we do is about, should be about photosynthesizing and root exuding. And so that's where crimping, well, crimping pasture is now, I, I'm just buying a crimper because <clears throat> I think crimping pasture has a huge potential to give advantage and obviously going to be much less expensive than mowing. Um, I'd say one final thing about soil specifics, and each farm is different. And in soil science, they talk about specific, you know, particular pedographic uh, process, specific pedographic, pedogenic rather, pedo Greek for the soil, soil genic, forming. soil forming, specific soil forming process. And there are 39 general horizons, and really only a dozen of them are fit to optimize biology, okay? So that's the, that's the taxonomy. So most people's soils really, and even before the human events, probably could be improved to optimize biosystems. And so truly trying to drill down on what your soil situation is and, and the changes in it, um, it, it's hard to overstate how important that is. You know, the farmer's footsteps are the best manure. There were more questions um, in the middle, in the back there. Um, could you guys all talk a little bit about your favorite soil test and whether there's a soil test that tests for glomalin? Okay, favorite soil test and whether there's a soil test that tests for glomalin. Uh, glomalin is extractable. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, pro, uh, cit it's a, it's soluble in a, in a citrate and you have to get pretty high temperatures. So it's expensive to actually extract your glomalin. It's very interesting because you take a beautiful black soil and you extract the glomalin and it turns gray and you know it looks like ground bone or something and then there's this other vibrant brown glue material. Wow. Um, so uh, it's, it's outside the scope of I think what most of us want to pay for. Uh, there are labs that would probably do it. I don't think you do it at home much. Um, Soil tests a huge subject about whether they cause more confusion than they, <laughs> than they. Um, we, we really do a, a broad range of soil testing. Uh, everything from, from uh, saturated media, media, which gives you a snapshot about what's soluble the moment you took that sample, it, depending on how good your sample was. And sampling is another big conversation. We always look for totals. Because we understand that that in an organic in a, in a biologically mediated system, our, our goal is to have most of the nutrient be insoluble until foraged for at the request of the plant, um, if that makes any sense. So when we formulate a container media, we a saturated media test, we get this a lot. Someone will get a batch of potting soil and they'll send off a standard test and they'll get a saturated media test they'll come back and say well no this can't grow anything and well yeah not yet not until you're growing something because that soil is latent okay I, if i were emperor of the planet or even just compost czar <laughs> you could only the word soil would mean that a plant had organized it so when we send you a potting media we promise you that there's no viable plant genetics in it, that you get to choose that organizer. But we then also promise you that all its friends are there and that there are nutrients bound in the complex, humus complex available for devolution when the plant requests it. Now, when that system is working well, that's much better than fertigating because it makes its own time. Gets cloudy, tomato calls for a different mix. That's been proven. So, um, yeah. Um, I'll just say what they all say about soil tests. Just use the same lab year after year because 
from me can tell me the management, I have good records on what I've done. If I can see a trend over time moving in a good direction, I know I'm doing what I want to see. So pick one and be consistent and you know, don't pick one for Arizona. You know, pick one that's for humid. And then every couple of years, mix it up and send some around and really get yourself crazy. Right, but still do your standard one. opinions uh? so yeah I, I think that's a, that's a, a really important question of, of you know sort of what what's the best uh, soil lab or what is what are, what are a bunch of really good soil labs and and uh, so so just I guess that we haven't had any recommendations except for just use the same one uh, over I'll, I'll okay Carl's gonna recommend so for the challenge with laboratory labs is that nobody in laboratory administration seems to think that it's important to have good soil labs, even at soil land grant university. So Vermont basically hasn't had anybody in the lab for, you know, except Joe for, I mean, it's overwhelmed. So we now, because we really need results back relatively quickly in New England, generally we're, we're using Maine. Um, and we, we, d we do it pretty often. Our, our, my lab person went to Orono, and so she knows people. And we, we, we've we've had some issues with how, you know their methodology and and what we want to get at. But that we feel like they're pretty consistent, and they turn around, and they're available, and there are people that answer the phone. And um, so we're sorry. Which lab is it? University of Maine. In Orono. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think it's in Orono. Yeah, Orono. Yeah. Great, and I, I would agree, and, and Penn State is also another really good one. So, yeah, another question. Yeah. Um, I know buckwheat is a phosphorus and calcium scavenger. Could you potentially grow that in a greenhouse and remove the residue? Would it, would it affect the high phosphorus? Uh, okay, this is, so the, the question is, could you use buckwheat perhaps to, to remove some, some other high levels of, of uh, <laughs> Calcium and phosphorus, that sort of thing. Um, that's a really good question. I, I would say that, that um, especially for um, field crop producers, alfalfa is, is the one. Uh, alfalfa hay will remove huge quantities of calcium, phosphorus, and potassium, and nitrogen, but it's also producing a ton of nitrogen. So, it, but it, it, you know, it's going to be in the, in, the, in the field for three, four years. So you have to have the rotation that can do that. But if you, if you really desperately want to get rid of phosphorus and, and uh, calcium and potassium, grow off alpha and export it off your farm. Alternatively, if you want to retain that stuff, don't grow a hay crop and export it off your farm. So, and, and potassium, luckily, is a little bit easier to, to, um, to manage uh, with you know, there are organic sources of potassium sulfate. So you could conceivably, you know, keep your potassium levels pretty high by maybe adding some potassium sulfate to alfalfa, which is a commonly a top dressing for alfalfa, and, and then exporting the crop. Fa uh, buckwheat can do that to a, a, some degree, but a lesser degree than, I mean, the, the alfalfa, the legumes really, they really love calcium and phosphorus, basically. Buckwheat, so that's a good question. Buckwheat would just be a quick way, maybe, in a high tunnel situation. Yeah, in a high tunnel, I mean, it's, it's it's, it's, it's hard because the, the crops are so valuable, the opportunity cost is so high that, that that's, I think, why everybody has trouble. Once you get yourself boxed into a corner in a high tunnel, you're, you're really in trouble. You really, you know, can't figure it out. So, and Seth has kind of pointed to that. I'm going to let you say a few words, but, but, um, but clearly, and, and we've had great presentations at this conference about this, Try to avoid getting boxed in in the first place. But Seth, yeah, say maybe a few more words on that. As far as crop r removing? Yeah, just yeah, is there, the, are there any strategies? The, t uh, the, ton the tonnage you'd have to take out would be so high. You'd have to do it over and over and over and over. Wouldn't, not practical, yeah. from my point of view, anyway. Yeah. OK, another question. Uh, yeah, you on the side there. Me? Yeah. OK. So my question is specific to smaller farms, and I, I, this is my farm in particular. I think it would apply to a lot of new small farms that are starting up. There's a lot of growers now that are that are doing really well for themselves and claiming that they're making over six figures, and they're farming on less than three acres. It's very popular right now. I fall into that category. So to, 
to be a good farmer at that scale, some of these guys are not cover cropping. They're really emphasizing compost. They're also emphasizing renewable wood chips. And they're, they're, some of them aren't tilling at all, or they're light tilling the top of the soil with, you know, like the, the tilter or the thing from Johnny's or like the power harrow. Mm -hmm. It's very popular right now. I, I, like I said, I fall in that category, but we just till lightly with tractor. We try to sort of mimic that in soil health wise. So I think there's a lot of great stuff there. And like, I'm just trying to figure out how, like you're saying don't add too much compost. Know what's in your compost. You also have to know what soil you have. It's very important. Do you have clay, do you have sand? But coming up with a program for these smaller farms that's going to last a long time. So my fear is what happens in eight years? You know, after maybe working, we're applying compost, are we going to end up having too much of the phosphorus buildup? These are all concerns of mine, and um, I'm paying, you know, I can just tell you like my numbers, like we're paying like $1,500 for compost per season on three acres, which is not, not bad, it's $25. So I'm, getting, I'm paying 25 a yard. But I'm, I'm worried about what we're doing with the compost now after listening to you talk about that. Yeah. Especially in high tunnels. You think about high tunnels, you're not cover in a lot of these high tunnels. You're just adding every year. So if you do that kind of situation with the field, you know, how do you, how do you manage that? I yeah. guess my question is what's a good, good program to maybe like... That's a great question. Yeah, I, I'm going to say something first and then we'll, we'll pass it along. But yeah, well, I'm just going to restate that essentially so everybody can hear it. But um, on some of the, uh, the intensive, super high value uh, farming uh, sort of practices that are, that are being, for good reason, uh, shared a lot lately, uh, a lot of times the compost application rates are really high, 10 tons per acre per crop per year, in, or at least, sometimes up to maybe 60, 70 tons per acre per year. And so the question is, how do we reconcile that with what we just heard and do it on a sustainable basis? Um, and, and it's a great question because uh, at least for, for several years in there, those practices can produce super high yields. Uh, you can plant your crops really close, get really excellent yields and that sort of thing. But the question is, okay, on a sustainable basis, what happens in, in the longer run? And, and I'll just say very quickly that we're doing some research on sort of exactly that uh, in some permanent bed trials. Uh, and you can check out the uh, Cornell uh, Small Farms Project uh, website and find out more about that. But now I'm gonna, and I just wanted to say one other quick thing that I, I, I have, all, this is a very stimulating conversation. But the, um, the, 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 the uh, high tunnels, hoop houses, greenhouses uh, are sort of like gigantic container media. So it's kind of like, you know, Carl, and, in, and yeah, and the the water is very very closely um, monitored. So they t they can teach us the same as Carl was mentioning um, that that uh, you know like potting soil can with real small containers can teach us about uh, what these materials kind of do in extreme kind of situations. But yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it to to, to Justin first because he was excited about. I just wanted to say it is really, really, really easy to get past that 20 parts per million phosphorus level. Vermont, it's law. I think Massachusetts is coming. It's coming everywhere. I don't know if it's going to be 20, 30, 10, but you raise a good point of how sustainable is this, and it's an open question based on how you manage your farm, but there might be somebody dangling over you telling you what you can put down at some point soon. Um, if you look at some of the European nutrient laws are quite draconian. And we're nowhere near that in this country, but it could go that way if people keep just juicing the snot out of their soil. Uh, okay, so, so how long have you been doing it this way? Uh, two years. And what are your soil tests saying? Um, they're, they're pretty darn good, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, our, our, we got our pH dialed to 6.5. We have our NPK is dialed. I know what's in my compost. I know where I'm getting it from. So I, I soil test for that, and there's no weeds in it. The guy who makes it is incredible. So I'm afraid to keep doing it, though. Well, I, I, I don't be afraid. Just keep testing your soil. Yeah. Test it twice a year. You know. Yeah. Yeah, because it's about the ratio of the elements. You know, plants need five times as much nitrogen as they do phosphorus, typically. So if your compost is applying them at equal measure. We're also adding nutrients as well. Yeah. Like super N, super well, you're keeping an eye on it, so. Well, and, and as somebody said at a 
con a, a workshop I was in yesterday, well, it's not like nitrogen comes out of the air, which I thought was funny. Uh, <laughs> and and it, it, it often feels that way when you're, when you're cropping. But that is actually where nitrogen is supposed to come from. Uh, it's where most of it is. So, um, and there are many, many, we're, th it's much more complex than just there's only rhizobia and that we know how. There's a lot of, because <laughs> air is around, it, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the soil capability has to do with the soil's gas, air, gas, liquid, rather, capabilities. Uh, this has somewhat to do with water table. It also has to do with, with how occluded the pore spaces are. The soil textures all, all have a lot to do with how much air is actually there. And since, you know, if you're going to fix atmospheric nitrogen, well, you got to get the air down in there. And so, so this is, again, about it is all matters. When you, change, when you do something like throw a piece of plastic over it, that's a major specific pedogenic process change. That's, that, that, this is no longer like the rest of your farm, even if it's the same matrix in the first instance. Uh, and I was going to, this alfalfa thing, if, if you take your step, you're going to use alfalfa for all the great things alfalfa provides, deep penetration, utilizing of some of these nutrients of concern. If you add to that your concern as a glomalin grower that you want to optimize that, add a grass, throw some brome, out, first of all, from a hay perspective, we're just starting to understand why grass adds weight overall. That you get better yields if you add a grass. And grasses and legumes have evolved and co-evolved and do a lot of synergies. They hire, they remunerate partners that alfalfa doesn't have to do good things for alfalfa, the brome will. So yeah. Great. Try to diversify and not mono. I'd say right now. We got, I have only time for one more question. I just want to say something about phosphorus because, I mean, so I'm from Vermont, and I'm really glad we have those regulations. It's amazing. They put in a bunch of things about buffer zones. But the part about 20 parts per million of phosphorus, I wish it would have been a little more nuanced where so many farms, any organic farm mostly that has been organic vegetable farm, has been in production for over 10 years, has over 20 parts. Most likely. They had been told to spread tons of compost. You know, there's so much imported grain from the Midwest that is full of phosphorus. Phosphorus has to go somewhere. And what's been happening is farmers are relying in Vermont more and more, more and more on mined resources and I from Chile. Or you know, and I feel like that's a not in my backyard solving the problem. Nitrogen is also a pollutant that gets into the waterways. We focus so much on phosphorus in that bill. And I just want to say, people are working on it in New York. Think about nitrogen, too. We're over-applying nitrogen. Nitrogen is so volatile. Phosphorus runs off. And it can leach at really high amounts. But it's, I wish they had made the law so that if you're not going to run off, you could have higher than 20 parts per million. Because phosphorus has to go somewhere. There's tons of phosphorus in Vermont. And now people are sitting on manure piles and compost. I mean, so the farm I work at, we can't, it, the, the regulation actually says you can apply compost if you're over 20 parts per million to a certain level, as long as you don't add to the phosphorus. So you, basically your plant has to uptake it. Anyway, it's a huge issue. And I, you know, there was all these farm inputs and I don't feel like the state actually listened to the farmers when they made the regulation. And, I'm just, for, if there's any state regulators here from New York, listen to the farmers because it makes a difference. It, it's your livelihood. And so now people are importing stuff from Chile and that's causing, you know, it's anyways. Yeah, so I, I hope everybody could hear that. Essentially that, that uh, if, if we can't, if we're not going to use some of these uh, waste products on our, all our dairy farms and other kind of poultry farms that are from the importation of grain from the Midwest, which is the source of, of all this phosphorus and, and actually nitrogen and potassium. And the source of that is actually chemical NPK, right? That's, that's what's feeding these animals that's producing the manure that, that then we're trying to deal with it. Okay, so in terms of, I think it, the, the, maybe the law is not nuanced enough in Vermont, which I totally believe, but we have to be thinking about that in, in sort of the big picture. And I, I think that's probably a, <coughs> 
Uh, any more, one last quick statements uh, by you guys? Because I, I'm in Vermont. And most phosphorus, the gross loading in our water is soil going in the water. Phosphorus is not especially mobile through soil. It's more mobile than we used to think and can be mobilized. But most of this is about, and we have it all satellite mapped. We know where every crack is where soil is going into water. So I, I'm really, I, I believe that we have to understand that good farms are the filter. Good farms are filters. And good structures and catchments and careful use of things like ray meal and outwashes and, and crushed stone and growing indicator plants, we can deal with both excess nitrogen and phosphorus by keeping the soil on the farms. Cool. Yeah. And, and, and the parking lots. I mean, that's another place where all this soil goes in water, falling off cars. Yeah, Vermont's a special situation because Vermont is the state most dominated by one sector of the agricultural economy. You know, it's like 90% of farm receipts in Vermont are dairy. Is that about right? <laughs> I don't think that's that far off. I mean, one cow generates, what, right now at current prices, three? Oh, no, I thought you were saying number of farm receipts. Oh, no, number, cash receipts. Cash. Yeah, and acreage, probably to a, you know even larger extent. And those, oh. and those farms are financially stretched. Yeah. So in Vermont, everything is based on dairy because, statistically speaking, that is pretty much all of Vermont farming. Whereas in New York, you have huge orchard industries and grain and dairy. So it's definitely different on this side of Okay, well, this, is, this has been a great conversation. Thank you very much, and, and we'll be around for a couple minutes here. Really appreciate it.